I think we're in the early stages of a bit of a seismic shift. If you rewind the tape pre-COVID, I think you had a lot of people who were building group practices for the sole purpose of exiting group practices. Right. But I think now you're seeing a lot of what I call mid-career dentists that are really early 40s enjoying the journey. These are entrepreneurs at heart. They don't play golf. They've got nowhere to go. They've got more than half their life ahead of them. And they love practicing clinically, being a business owner and being an entrepreneur. And simply they're looking at the growing debt burden of borrowing more and more money from a bank to keep buying or building practices. And they're sitting there saying to themselves like, gosh, I know the business cash flows wonderfully, but when am I going to get out from under all this debt? Well, the way to do that, especially if you're still committed to the journey and you love it, is a minority investment de-risks your position, puts a little bit of cash in the bank and gives you a second vehicle for growth, especially if they love the business you're building too, they probably make subsequent investments investments in it. So this is a phenomenon of build and operate, not yes. built for sale. Good day, everyone. This is Dr. David Phelps with the Freedom Founders Mastermind community and the Dennis Freedom Blueprint podcast here today to talk a lot about the opportunities and options and the risk factors with practice exit transitions. The market has changed immensely in just the last 18 months. What you don't know will probably hurt you. What you need to know can really help you. And today, you'll be pleased to interview with me, my guest, Mr. Perrin Desports. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is a fun thing for me to get to do because I've been able to bring some of my greatest mentors and, and peer group thought leaders to our group here for the next several weeks and doing some of these recordings with them. I, it's really my privilege and really a privilege to have uh, someone of the, the the means, the tenor, the experience that uh, our friend here today, uh, Mr. Perrin Desports has. Perrin, thank you so much for for giving your time to to the cause here today. David, it's it's my pleasure. I always enjoy spending time with you. Anytime that the David Phelps phone rings, I'm one to answer it. So looking forward to today's discussion for sure. Well, I appreciate that, and 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 like like some of the other people that I've I've brought to the forefront here, you bring uh, your own unique but very deep experience in really all things dentistry. And, and we can give a little bit of that background because I think it helps for people to know, well, where, where did you come from? Did you just, to just like jump into dentistry because uh, dentistry has had all these great multiples in the last couple of years. And I know that's not the case at all. Uh, what, well, first of all, uh, let's just talk about the company as it exists today, uh, Polaris Healthcare Partners. And let's give us uh, just a, a broad overview of what you and, and your partner to Walker uh, set out to do kind of what your mandate is and then let's a little bit of your history and then we'll dig into the conversation for today. How's yeah. That? Yeah. Ha happy to do it. And I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, so DeWalker Sinha and I are, are the two co-founders of Polaris Healthcare Partners and Polaris is a, a multifaceted firm. We have a, a what I call the consulting side of the business where we help entrepreneurial dentists and healthcare professionals build group practices uh, we also help them devise ways to bring associates and executives into the ownership structures of those businesses. All of our clients are what we call doctor founded and debt funded. And that's a fancy way of saying that these are entrepreneurs who happen to be healthcare providers who want to build a, a, a multi-location group and they want to use bank funds to do it. So all of our our clients that are in the, the growth side of our business are, are uh, looking for banking solutions to continue to, to buy or build locations. And obviously, bringing associates into the ownership structure of those businesses is critically important because it creates stability and a continuity of care and also creates continuity, continuity of cash flow. At some point, um, most people, most uh, clients will, will say, uh, hey, Perrin, I think it's time for me to take some chips off the table. I've built a really valuable business. I'd like to maybe exit outright or do a partial exit. I'd like to bring on a capital partner from an equity standpoint. And so we represent those clients and as a sell side advisor uh, in a private equity based transaction. Could be a majority sale, could be a minority sale, um, could be a lot of different structures involved with it. But we have the two sides of the business are the consulting side and the sell side advisory side of the business. And so as I well, let's let's, let's also give your, your background because I, I, I don't want to miss that. Um, you, you come from a, a, a family business that was involved uh, in dentistry, um, you know, generation uh, prior. What, just give us that little bit of history. It's, it's interesting and, and how you how that merged uh, with Patterson and then why you didn't stay with Patterson. It's all part of the story. Sure, sure. So 
um, it, it, you could say that I was born into the business almost. Um, my family owned a dental distribution company called Thompson Dental Company that was headquartered out of Columbia, South Carolina. And the business was started in 1899, believe it or not, by my great grandfather, James Perrin Thompson in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I was fourth generation in the business um, when I came to work for the, the family company back in 1995. My father was president and CEO, and my grandfather was chairman of the board. Um, it was a business that had, I think, 14 sales offices from Baltimore through Orlando, um, was on a run rate to do about $100 million in sales, $100 million in revenue. Um, the year that we elected to, to sell the business to Patterson, that was in 2002, and we elected to sell the business not for what I would call operational reasons and candidly not really for financial reasons, but due to poor equity transition planning on behalf of my grandfather. Um, my, my father has two sisters uh, and my grandfather's estate upon his ultimate demise was going to be share and share alike. So, mm -hmm. David, I'm not a math major and I'm, I'm really not that bright, but I can kind of do the math when... Two people who don't work in the business, neither do their husbands or any of their children, uh, want to get their money out of the business. It was a valuable enough company that there wasn't going to be a way for my father to buy them out. Um, and so really the only course of action was to find a, an acquirer for the business. And the two uh, logical choices would be Patterson or Shine, the two publicly traded companies in the space. And, and it ended up being that Patterson was a better fit, both geographically, philosophically, and, and from a, uh, you know, a background. We knew a lot of the people at Patterson. Uh, and it ended up being a, a great transition for the vast majority of the employees. I ended up um, having a I think a pretty decent career. I stayed with Patterson for 15 years and I ran three different businesses for them. And I always tell people that I wish I'd had a little bit longer to work for my father versus the seven years that I did. Um, and, and I, I didn't miss out on too much, but I just would have liked a little bit more time maybe. But at the same time, I, I probably wouldn't have learned all the things that I did at an enterprise level running those businesses for Patterson. They gave me a lot of responsibility early on at 31 years old. I had full P&L responsibility. Um, I turned around a couple of branches and the last branch that I ran, Charlotte, uh, won a handful of awards the last uh, four out of the last five years that I was there. So I'm grateful for my time at Patterson um, and they were really, really good to me. But mid-career, mid-40s, I started thinking I didn't want, I didn't have another 20 years in me to, to do that. And I wasn't going to move to Minneapolis to take a job with a corporate office. And so I, I pulled the ripcord and became a full-fledged entrepreneur. And that's worked out pretty well too. So I'm, I'm grateful all the way around. Right. Very good. All right. So I, I want to focus a little bit more so today on your sell side advisory. Uh, and, but also as we've spoken in the past uh, with that sell side advisory, uh, it's different. I would say, and you would say as well, than a you know conventional practice transition broker, uh, and and that is you, you love to do, which I love too. Uh, when I work with my clients, I love to be on the consultative side before we start figuring out well what's the strategy for whatever we're doing, what's investments or that kind of thing. So let's let's start there. Let's let's talk about really define you know the avatar for someone who might come to Polaris, come to you, and say I'd like to get some help with looking at my opportunities or my options, uh, I might want to sell my practice. And that could be one solo practice, but with a certain revenue uh, run rate, or it could be a, a group practice that doesn't want to grow anymore, right? So let's define that. And then let's talk about why consultation is something that you really are, or really want to make that the pillar of where things go next. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. And I love the fact that you even prefaced it by saying if you if you came to me and said that you're thinking about this, you're already in the right direction with it. I think all too often, um, people who own businesses and dentists are no different. They reach a point of finality in their mind where they've had a bad week or a bad year, or, you know, a bad day or something like that. And they just kind of throw their hands up and they want to be done with it. And that's a really bad position to be in as a business owner. Um, if you want to transact your business, transition your business, it is a very forward-looking um, uh, type of set of decision criteria. We don't work with traditional solo practices. So think, you know, ADA average 750,000 in revenue or something like that. These are businesses that um, would value in such a way that a, 
uh, a young associate can probably qualify for the amount of funds necessary from a bank to buy out a senior uh, seller at that point. And, and it can be a, a point of finality in terms of their transaction. That being said, I think we're seeing a lot more um, uh, business owners now that have larger footprints, single locations that generate two, three, four, five million in revenue, some of them that are much larger and generate a lot more than that. These are not traditional solo practices and they value much higher than that. So when somebody comes to, and, and for that reason, it, they value at a level that a bank's probably not going to loan the money to any individual buyer to buy out the, the senior founder, right? So now we have a little bit of a, a question in our mind about how do we transact the business and to whom? So the first thing about this is if you own uh, a high value solo practice or a multi-location group, your transaction is going to be a process and not an event. And you need to approach it that way if you, if you intend to get maximum value out of it. Nobody really wants to take a discount on their life's work, I don't think. So if you want to get maximum value out of it, it needs to be a process and not an event. The second thing is you need to understand who the logical buyers are. And more often than not, I would say for a high value practice or, or small group, it's probably going to be a private equity backed venture. That could be a majority transaction. It could be a minority transaction. Um, and there are pluses and minuses to both. But the likelihood of it being a bank funded, you know, young associate is is a very tall ask. I'm not saying that they've built a business that's too valuable to be sold, but I think it takes a, a process to work through the specifics. The next thing I would say is we need to be eyes wide open about how the business values and how we calculate valuation for that type of a, a high value practice and whatever it values at, what's the transaction structure? So there's some amount that a, a private equity backed venture will pay in cash and probably some amount in an equity role into the parent company. Beyond that, there are fees that are involved to the advisor, to the accountant, to the attorney, and unfortunately, some taxes probably to the government as well. And most of the clients we end up working with in a sell-side advisory uh, role have some amount of debt on the business. Yeah. So when we start thinking about valuation, less taxes, less fees, and we subtract the amount you got to pay off to the bank, the question becomes what's left. Yes. And is the transaction worth actually going through the process to do? Are you going to put enough in the bank to make it worth your while? And if the answer is no, we'd rather find out about that before we're in market, before we start spending money, before we start getting emotionally invested in it, and before we have other people interested in the business that we're representing. So it could very well be, David, on the very, very front end, when somebody comes to us in the consultative approach, that we say, hey, Dr. Phelps, we think you have a valuable business, but through our consulting lens, we think there may be a couple of ways to improve the business operationally, financially, systems, fees, profitability wise. We think there may be an untapped potential of an additional 10 to 20 percent in this business. Wouldn't it be better if we work together maybe for six months or something to, to improve the business and then took it to market at that point? And our, our company has sell side advisory and consulting services. So we always look at a, a potential sell side advisory client through the lens of consulting first. Well, again, as I said earlier, that I think that is just so much wisdom. And I think it shows, you know, your your experience in in overall business. You know, when I, I look at the same thing, when I'm and of course I don't do what you do. I'm not in the uh consultation, a consultative basis of of practice um growth or or management, I have some of my own experience, but that doesn't mean I have I have the ability. But I I understand I understand it. Uh, you know what we do. So what we do is is we really with our clients we go really far upstream, uh, or you could say well I could say you could say downstream and we go back upstream. So if we go way out and say to your point, well, how much do I have when all this is said and done? You know, and that's that's where you start. That's you know beginning beginning with the end in mind, and then working backward to where we are and say oh. Well, if that's not enough, then to your point, well, what are some things we can do to leverage, uh, turn some dials that could potentially get it to where we need? You know, where I, I start is kind of where you um, help someone end with you know that that end point is, well, if this is enough, how much is that? And then if they're happy with that, then you can go forward. If not, we're going to get to where you need to be. 
where I start with people is, well, how much is enough for you after we go through all the iterations of, of the of, of the fees and, and the, paying off the debt uh, and the, the advisors and, and the taxes, of course, uh, that we, 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 we like to like not think about that. But then Uncle Sam's right there with his hand at the table and you're going, wait, where did that come from? Uh, just a small detail. But it's important to understand that because, as we said, we talked about earlier, Karen, is, you know, we, people start doing the math in their heads and they go, OK, well, you know, private sale, you know, traditionally, uh, you know, 70 to 90 percent of the uh, last three years collections. Or if I'm looking at DSO, gosh, they're paying X, Y, Z multiples. And I can I can do that math in my head. Wow. That sounds like a pretty big number. And then we have to say, well, that's not what you end up with. So we take it from, well, here's what you could end up with. Um, now, how can you make that capital work for you? And that's that's another conversation that we have at Freedom Founders, but I want to back back into what you're doing because that's so important. So so in in the process of, of talking to those and doing the consultation, uh, I'm just curious what what percentage uh, that come to you for sell-side advisory uh, when you go through the consultation and show them, well, this is likely if you go to, go to market now and maybe get a transaction done in the next six or nine months, here's what you end up with. How many say, oh, that's good versus how many say, I'm not quite ready to pull the trigger yet. Just I'm just curious. Um, you know, I, I would say if they have not been working with us in a consulting capacity up to this point, if they have been a, a follower of our podcast or seen us speak on a stage or something like that, and they reach out to us kind of, uh, you know, without any prior work history together, I, I think we have that same uh, initial conversation around, okay, what what are your expectations in terms of the bare minimum number you need to net cash in the bank? You know, and, and they'll tell us and we'll work the number backwards to the trans through the fees, taxes, debt and up to the transaction value and then work the, the, the multiples back to the EBITDA volume where they are. Now, we, it's kind of connecting the dots in reverse yeah. order. So, you know, I would say for those that have never had any experience with us in a consulting relationship, probably about 60 percent of them end up going to market. For those that do have an experience working with us and consulting, um, you know, we're we're involved in the conversations along the way to where if somebody says, hey, Perrin, my my num my net number is 10 million or whatever the number is. Right. I can usually tell them before they ask me that, hey, Dr. Phelps, I think you're at your number based on the financial analysis we do every quarter with our consulting clients to be able to say, you know, David, you said your number was this. Here's what I'm looking at on the numbers in terms of financial analysis. I think you're there if you're ready. So it's your call, but I'm just saying that I feel pretty certain that based on our prior conversations, you're where you need to be. Uh, and that's that's all but a, a 100% at that point. When you ask the question, how much Dr. Do you want or desire to have net after the transaction transaction is completed? How many can actually give you that number with specificity you, uh, and, with, with, and, with, and, with, and with some some math behind it? I, I knew you were going to ask me uh -huh. this question, and um, I, you know, I'm I'm almost reluctant to say not many. A and the reason for that is, I think we're our industry is is suffering from uh, um, remember Alan Greenspan's comment about delusional grandeur or um, uh, delusions of grandeur and irrational exuberance from right. you know back in the Clinton administration and right. everything. Some of your audience may not remember the Clinton administration. Uh, uh, I remember bits and pieces of it. Right. Um, so, you know, I think that ir irrational exuberance around valuations, multiples, dollar sale amounts are the top line number. They're the three inch mm -hmm. headline uh, at the front of the newspaper or in your news feed. Right. And, you know, coming out of covid when uh, when when private equity backed ventures were, were spending money like drunken sailors and the cost of debt funds was all but zero and they could borrow unlimited amounts of funds, you had you know, decent businesses being overvalued by one to two to three turns or more. And, and I think people got seduced into thinking that their businesses were uh, worth more than what they actually were because back then somebody was willing to pay for it. Um, and they, they didn't, they didn't really have the discipline to look at the valuation all the way through to what the bottom line net is. 
um, or they weren't equipped to do that or nobody had ever taken them through that process to do it, those calculations to do it. And I think when somebody doesn't know what their, their true walk away number is, they start to compound bad decisions and, and that, there are some things that we can figure out along the way to guide the client, but there's some things that we just can't because we don't know what, or they, or they haven't really sold themselves on what their answer is to us, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know? And, and what you find is that selling a business is uh, an emotional roller coaster. Um, people start spending money in their mind before it's in their bank account. They get vested in an outcome that may be, um, uh, not the one they ultimately really aspired to have. And this all creates complications when, when there's a lot of dollars involved. On the other hand, when you do have somebody that says, Hey, Perrin, look, I, I know my EBITDA is $4 million. You know, I, uh, you know, at a, at a minimum, I need 35 million out of this transaction to pay off debt, pay off taxes, to put, you know, 18 million in my investment account for, for me to be willing to walk away from this business that's firing on all cylinders. Now, that's not a point of desperation. That's an entrepreneur saying, hey, Perrin, for me to make this worth my while and take my hands off the wheel, here's the number I got to get to net. At that point, the onus is on us to drive the process to yield the outcome that, that creates the transaction that our client wants. But we're all operating from a point of certainty. And if the market pro- marketed sales process starts to come up short, well, there's, there's no grievance by any party to simply go back to work in the business and come back to the market six months later or, or a year later or something like that. And it's not a, with us, Another beauty of, of our business is that with a consulting side of the business, that's the retainer based business for us. That's why that's how we make all of our internal investment decisions around hiring and everything. We're not dependent upon a client's transaction to keep the doors open or to keep Polaris afloat. So when we may tell a client, it's not in your best interest to take this deal that's being offered. Let's go back to work for six months. Let's come back to market in six months or however long. And let's revisit it at that point. And we've done that before because we're not desperate to force a client into a transaction. That was a little bit of a winding answer, but it was a really good question. So I, I hope I didn't go off message. No, too no, much. no. I think it was it was perfect. And and that's you know what I try to, I guess, give a little bit of a, a, a warning or uh, just advice from my 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 experience in you know all things transactions is that. There are there's a group of people that once they get involved, and that could be a broker and the attorney and the CPA, and there's other ancillary people that are part of getting it done. But n- none of those people you know get anything out of it for themselves, which is important at some point uh, until the transaction goes through. Um, and, and many business models are set that way. I mean, realtors that uh, list properties uh, they don't make uh, anything off that 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 commission uh, and, until the the property sells. So. As long as people are aware of where the incentives are, I think are important. Again, I'm not saying anything derogatory about the expertise that people bring to the table. We need those people, uh, but if if they're driven by incentives, you know that at some point reflect on their needs, then we just got to be a little bit careful. So I, I I really appreciate the fact that you you're holistic and you have no bias on whether a transaction goes through or not. You want to do what's right for the client at the right time and. Uh, that's where I love to be um, in, in what I do. No, no. Uh, yeah. No, I, I mean, let's, uh, let's be honest. I, I'd rather close a multi-million dollar transaction than not, <laughs> but the viability of our business is not dependent upon mm-hmm. that, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I think that gives us a, a point of confidence that we, we think we can give the right recommendation to the client that's in their best interest because, you know, we're not under any urgency of time or, or making payroll or, or anything like that. And I mean, I think that's, I'd like to think that gives us a little bit more unbiased opinion, but you know. Yeah. So you said earlier that um, some of the, the structures uh, of the buyers, and I assume we're talking about private equity backed DSOs. Uh, you mentioned something that I wasn't aware of. You said uh, there could be a you know majority uh, interest buy, which is what I thought most of them did. But you said also a minority interest. I, I was not aware. Uh, tell, I mean, explain that because I, I don't really understand how that model model works and where it works. 
Yeah, so I think that um, the vast majority of our world, as it relates to private equity backed DSOs and MSOs, has always been um, just, for example, the the private equity backed venture buying eighty percent of your business or or group practice, um, and the balance of twenty uh, percent being a an equity role into the parent company to help align our interests and to also give you the opportunity at something called a second bite of the apple, which is when the the private equity owner of the business decides to recap it and another private equity venture buys them out um, and the equity releases and it's usually a uh, or historically it's been a very um, advantageous uh, internal rate of return for people who've done that. That being said. There are um, not not all private equity groups are alike or, or private equity is not just one type of a monolithic industry. There is something uh, called family offices and minority investment firms that typically have longer hold cycles um, or, or around their investment. A typical private equity group probably holds an asset, meaning they own a company um, for five to seven years before they start going through the process of divesting of it. Family offices and um, pension funds and, and things like that are a longer hold type of a, a discipline. Um, and they typically are a bit more of a, um, a little bit more hands off, I would say, as it relates to operational control. Now, David, you may have built a very valuable company that you've taken as far as you can you want to stay in it, but you know that you need somebody to to bring in a CFO or a COO or some HR uh, specialist and things like that. Build a bench that you just haven't had the the wherewithal time or expertise to do. And a private equity firm can sometimes furnish that type of leadership structure. All right, so they bring more than just capital; they bring boots on the ground, operational experience. On the other hand, you may say, "Look, you know, I, I, I'm I've kind of." exhausted the possibilities of growing with traditional senior debt. I'm looking to take some chips off the table for me and my family, but I want both hands on the wheel. I, I'm I'm just at halftime of this business. I feel like I'm the right leader. I'm the founder. I can continue to take this thing a lot, lot further. And furthermore, I've got a good team around me and we are not at our ceiling in terms of expertise or capability. I want to keep growing. And that may be a scenario where you say, I'm not interested in somebody buying 80% of my business. For me to stay in it and continue working the way I have with the, the, the guts and the, the verve and the, the excitement that I have, you know, I might want to bring somebody in at a 40% ownership stake. Now, that's an equity investment from a third party entity but it's not 80% of the business. You and maybe your executive team or your, your associate minority partners still own 60% of the business, but you've taken some chips off the table from an, a, a minority partner standpoint. So they don't own a majority of the, of the equity. They own a minority uh, position in the, equity, in the cap table. We can get into things like voting control around seats on the board and all that kind of stuff on a subsequent podcast. But, but the, the, the rationale behind this is that I think they're, they're more mid career entrepreneurs who built successful businesses who aren't ready to sell them and walk away, but they'd also like to de-risk part of their position for them and th themselves and their families, and maybe use some of that taking chips off the table into diversified portfolio like what y'all do and, and um, what you're great at. And, and I think a minority position facilitates some of that. Well, yes, I really, this is the first time I was aware that that was an option. And it makes sense that there are um, family offices or as you said, uh, pension funds that are not in the game of, uh, you know, relatively quick turns that they, they, they want to stay in and, and, and ride, a, ride a good business in an equity position. So, so I, I'm just, guessing i you know i don't go out like i don't have all the contacts that you you and to walker have that's what you do it, what i guess my question is like what per, today what percentage in the last couple of years what percentage of of transactions are majority versus minority maybe let's start there i'm just getting some some idea what what that what that represents in the marketplace and dentistry uh, i mean i think that 
the vast majority are majority uh, equity positions from uh, um, from buyers. Um, you know, probably if I think about you know our client base, it's it's probably ninety percent or more. Now uh, the reason for that is a lot of these were later stage owners of of mm -hmm. uh, uh, mature businesses, um, and and they're they're looking to. Um, certainly de-risk their position, take some chips off the table, but also um, from a standpoint of a little bit of the work, work life balance, they, they don't want to be like on the limit as much as they have been in the last, you know, couple of decades of building the business. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think what we're seeing though, is that there's a, and they're not many I don't hear a minority position being talked about too terribly often on podcasts or the stage or, or otherwise. So I think the, the minority investment piece of it is just unknown yeah. to most of the marketplace and they don't know the questions to ask. And probably right. their sell side advisor isn't opening up the, mm -hmm. the complete envelope in terms of all the possibilities here. Um, so, you know, some of it's a, if you don't know the questions to ask and, and maybe if the sell side advisor isn't going through a thorough process to find out what really moves the needle for the prospective client at hand, then, you know, there is no solution there. But I, I would say there are more and more firms, uh, investment firms that are willing to take um, minority positions. Um, and, and I would also say that there, there are more like family office type firms that love the returns of dentistry. Yeah, I mean, of all healthcare services, it, usually these businesses are very sticky from a, 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 a customer retention or a patient retention standpoint, and that bodes well for cash flow, which is usually what these businesses are, are after, what, what these investors are after. So it makes sense in a lot of uh, scenarios when, it, when the uh, business owner um, is at the right stage of their career, and, and if, they're, if they have the right, um, a kind of mindset as it relates to the next potentially decade or more. Yeah, because we both know uh, there's seems like the proliferation of, of younger doctors, dentists in their career who have managed to build uh, somewhat of an enterprise solo or multi practice, but they're maybe younger than 50 years of age uh, and maybe not really burned out, but they, but you said, want well, to take some chips off the table. And, and I, I've seen, watch many of them, you know, make the complete sale and wh whether they're happy with that afterwards, I think it takes some time to let that settle, but it is what it is. I'm just thinking if you're younger and you've done a good job just to de-risk, you know, a, a minority stake would, to me, would, would certainly have some, uh, some reasonable, reasonableness in, in decision-making uh, to look at. It, it absolutely does. And I think, you know, I, I think we're in the early stages of a bit of a seismic shift and and by that i mean if you rewind the tape pre covid private equity's uh influence in in dentistry was prolific mm -hmm. and driven by a lot of the returns that we were seeing right um right. and i think you had a lot of people who were building group practices for the sole purpose of yeah. exiting group practices right um coming out of covid there was still some of that for sure you know, the faint, the flames were fanned by sell side advisors and, and business development people that didn't make their number. And it was the perfect feeding frenzy. You capitalized on the anxiety of a lot of uh, dentist owners that just didn't want to own businesses anymore based on what they went through during COVID. I get all that. But I think now you're seeing a lot of what I call mid-career dentists that are really early 40s that are enjoying the journey. These are entrepreneurs at heart. They, mm. they don't play golf. They've got nowhere to go. They've mm. got more than half their life ahead of them. And they love practicing clinically, being a business owner and being an entrepreneur. And simply they're, they're looking at the growing debt burden of borrowing more and more money from a bank to keep acquire, buying or building practices. And they're sitting there saying to themselves like, Gosh, I know the business cash flows wonderfully, but when am I going to get out from under all this debt? I mean, I'd like to, you know, take some chips off the table for me and my family. Well, the way to do that, especially if you're still committed to the journey and you love it, is a minority investment de-risks your position, puts a little bit of cash in the bank, and gives you a second vehicle for growth 
especially if they love the business you're building too, they probably make subsequent investments in it. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a phenomenon of, of a uh, build and operate, not yes. built for sale. Right. Um, and I, I think, I don't want to get on a soapbox. I think that's a good thing for the profession. Oh, I, I would agree 100%. I, and I, I love the fact that you, you're looking at this kind of a sea change, a seismic shift, um, because the dynamics, as we well know, uh, pre-COVID, post-COVID are completely different today. Uh, we yeah. have, you know, we have the, in, in, the inflation that came out of a lot of that came out of COVID and a lot of other factors, of course. Uh, but at the same time, we've, we've seen the interest rates, uh, you know, go up by 500 basis points and now looking like they're stickier than uh, many thought them to be. That's uh, right. Which is which has got to be changing the dynamics of private equity. Uh, again, from those who are more aggregators and looking at the financialization of a dental practice, really what we would call trading practices. And now probably, again, as a good thing, uh, those that are wise are looking more, well, more like a family office. We need to be operators or work with work with operators. Or if we're going to take a majority, we better be operators. Uh, or if we're going to be a minority, let's work with a, an operator because we're going to run this thing for a while. We're not going to be flipping practices like we did back in the day. I, that's what I think. Is, is that what you're sensing? Yeah. So I, I said I wouldn't get on my soapbox and I'm only going to put one foot on it right now with you. Right. Um, but um, uh, so here, here's here's the context of the problem. Here's the the implications of the problem that you just described. Um, when When lending rates are so low and when uh, banks are willing to lend for all intents and purposes, unlimited sums of money to private equity type ventures that are of an aggregator mindset. All I'm interested in is buying as many practices as I can because the debt doesn't cost me anything. It's akin to an interest only loan, right? I'm not even paying principal on it most of the time. So I'm just buying practices. I'm willing to overpay for practices to get more of them. Why? Because I know that after I reach a certain threshold of EBITDA, I'm going to take this thing to the market. I'm going to recap it to another private equity group that's going to buy me out. And I'm going to make money on the equity position above the cost of the debt. That's the theory. Well, what happens to that theory when you have a 500 basis point improvement in banking terms, meaning escalation of rate? And all of a sudden, that dirt cheap cost of funds now costs me a lot. And because I'm not an operator of a mentality, right. oh gosh there's not enough cash flow or EBITDA at a practice level to now offset the rising cost of the debt. Yes. There are a number of enterprise level businesses that are in a workout procedure, which is basically a legal restructuring where the private equity owner hands the asset back to the bank because their equity position is worth nothing. That's right. What happened to everybody who had a business that should have valued it six times EBITDA but their sell side advisor recommended that they take the deal that was at nine times EBITDA. Now, it's not like selling a house, David. All right. If somebody is willing to pay you two to three turns more than what the, the asset should be valued at in a business and structure only part of it in cash and some of it in equity, what happens to your equity position when the parent companies goes up in smoke? Well, that return that you were sold on doesn't materialize. And you got a lot of hard work ahead of you to, to make it work out. There are a handful of larger groups that are very disciplined in what they will pay and what they won't. And when the flames were hottest, they were losing a lot of deals by a turn or two. Now that they're running sound operations that generate same store sales and EBITDA margin improvement, cost containment, and they're attracting us. They're doing all the fundamentals. Those businesses all of a sudden look a lot better, right? And those are the ones that are going to survive. They're in a better balance sheet position on a forward looking um, uh, aspect. And these are the ones that candidly, when we recommend to a client not to take a, an 11 times deal in favor of one that's eight and a half, mm -hmm. you would look at me like I've lost my, my mind, right? But we've sure. had to do that with a couple of businesses who are very, very valued and we would have made more in commission if they took the higher deal. But we knew or we, we felt that the best thing for our client, because he had been a legacy client, a consulting client, that we were not just gonna grab the highest offer, see you later, Dr. Smith, 
you know, and, and we're on to the next one. Right. So I think all of this has caused a lot of that mid tier market that I referenced in the prior uh, answer. There have been a lot of people that are saying, I don't know that I'm in a rush to sell my business because I don't want to see my life's work kind of go up in smoke the way some of my colleagues were who were bragging about the transactions they did a couple of years ago that now might not look so good. Well, that's that's so well said. And, and my experience in the markets and the interest rates and the recaps, as you know, comes from real estate, but it, it's all essentially the same thing. Uh, limited partners equity uh, can be gone in a flame because uh, they put their money with uh, m many, many real estate syndicators are kind of like a lot of the private equity that when debt was cheap, it's like, let's just get an asset. We might add a little bit of value to it and we're going to flip this thing and we're all going to make big money. And then whoa, interest rates come on big. And, and now there's this, 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 this pressure, these headwinds uh, that are pushing all that back. And so we see the same thing in real estate today where the banks are you know, taking the keys back and uh, waving goodbye to the uh, equity partners who were hoping for uh, some big wins on their money. Well, well Perrin, this is, this is really helpful. You know, I, I love talking to you and, and, and if or not that it's, it's late in the day uh, and you probably have some better things to do with your time, I would keep you on. I think it just means we need to come back and do another segment is what it means. Right. I think that's where we need to leave this today. So um, I just want to thank you for, for your time and the insights. And, and, you know, I, I learn something from you every time we, we speak. So it helps me because uh, I learned something about uh, uh, the minority versus majority structures that I wasn't aware of. And hopefully this is valuable to other people who are, uh, looking ahead and making decisions uh, to potentially sell or how to sell and 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 the options that they have to do it. There's there's more than uh, just a sell majority or, or don't sell at all. I mean, you, you've given us something a hybrid in between that could be viable for some people. So that's really really helpful. Well, thanks for having me on, David. I'm I'm I always love being with you. I learn from you on on all of our calls as well. And hopefully, I've shared you know a couple of things that maybe make some of your audience think a little bit differently about stuff it's to your point it's not a binary decision it's not a yes no it's not a an, an either or but if you if you work with the right advisor hopefully they're challenging your assumptions and hopefully they're making you think about things differently and hopefully they have a methodical uh, approach that's not with any urgency or emotion to to lead you in a direction that you might that might not be in your best interest yeah so well said all right parent sports Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. My, my pleasure. Great being on with you, David. Thank you. If you enjoyed watching or learning from this video, please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more content. If you have a question about any of my content or this specific video, just please leave a comment down below. And as always, stay focused on your freedom. I'll see you next time.